so as uh, Dr. Wright shared earlier, uh, the uh, the, uh, the Aldersgate Prize um, is motivated by the ethos of our Christian liberal learning community here at the John Wesley Honors College. And so we award each year the Aldersgate, Aldersgate Prize to celebrate the outstanding achievement of an author whose scholarship challenges reductionistic trends in academia by yielding a broadly integrative analysis of life's complexities and by shedding fresh light on ultimate questions that can enrich Christian conceptions of human flourishing. After reviewing more than 70 nominations for the 2020 Aldersgate Prize, the selection committee chose The Gardener's Dirty Hands, Environmental Politics and Christian Ethics by Noah Tolley as the best exemplar of this sort of scholarly work. Uh, after pandemic-related delays in the process, we were pleased this evening, with you present, most of you, uh, to finally award the 2020 Aldersgate Prize to Dr. Noah Tolley, and we now look forward to hearing his thoughts on the research and publication uh, of The Gardener's Dirty Hands. Uh, just by way of introduction, Dr. Tolley is, professor of, uh, is a professor of urban studies, politics, and international relations, who recently took up the post of provost at Calvin University. He is a non-residential senior fellow for Global Cities at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs and has taught on cities and urbanism in the Free University of Berlin's Center for Global Politics. Tolley also serves on the advisory council of Together Chicago, as well as the steering committee of the Thriving Cities Project and on the research team for the Project on Vocation and the Common Good, both based at the University of Virginia. In terms of this evening's format, uh, this, there will be a time, as I mentioned, for Q&A after the lecture. Uh, so if you uh, want to ask questions, please be sure to do so. And I'm looking in particular at those students in H&R 310 who have been reading the book. Uh, this is your opportunity to not be shy, like I heard you were a little bit shy earlier, and ask questions after, after his lecture. Nothing like embracing the public format for your questions instead of that smaller venue, but we hope that you'll come up and ask some questions. Um, before I invite Dr. Uh, Tolley out to, uh, to share with us, let me just ask the Lord's blessing on our time together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of community. We thank you for the gift of scholarship that allows us to think more deeply about how you wish us to live in your world. We thank you in particular, Lord, that scholarship that helps to remind us of the goodness of creation and the importance of learning to steward it well. Lord, we pray that you would anoint Dr. Tolley's words this evening. May he be able to share the things that you have placed on his heart, and may we be a receptive audience, we pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said. Amen. I love learning from what other institutions are doing, and I'm a bit of a higher ed nerd in that way. Um, in fact, when we would go on uh, driving trips when my kids were young, we would always just stop at colleges along the way because this was intriguing for my wife and I. Eventually we had to stop that because we thought we would ruin college for them and they would never want to go. They started saying, no, no, not another college stop. And we said, yes, yes, it's only going to take us five minutes to get there off the freeway. Um, that was uh, something that didn't last very long. But in my new role at Calvin, there's even more of a premium on that learning and I've had a chance to do that today. I've had a chance to do it in the morning, learning from your dean of the School of Health Science, and then throughout the day, uh, learning from Dr. Stassen's class, uh, being there to discuss important questions, and also in the faculty colloquium. Uh, today's given me a chance to see what the impact is of the Honors College here, and so thanks to all who taught me something. In fact, I'll add this. It was the best day of engagement with my book yet. And I've given this talk, not this talk exactly, but a talk on the book a few times. And I've been at other places that have said they've read my book. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. And the questions and engagement today have been by far the best of any of those engagements. So I, I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, a word about the Aldersgate Prize. Uh, thanks to Dean Riggs and also to President Wright uh, for this award. I want this audience in particular to know it's an incredible honor to receive the prize. I hinted at this over dinner, said a few words about it. Uh, when I opened the email, it was with great anticipation, and here's why. I wanted to know who won. I've been paying attention to this prize for all its years. 
since the first year it was given. I had not known my book was nominated. I was eager to learn what was the next book I ought to read. What was the next work that was recognized as having the virtues or characteristics that the Aldersgate Prize seeks to recognize or celebrate? And so this, this experience of being honored with the Aldersgate Prize is actually quite special. The, the characteristics that it celebrates, I treasure, challenging the reductionistic trends in academia by yielding a broadly integrative analysis of life's, life's complexities and by shedding fresh light on ultimate questions that can enrich Christian conceptions of human flourishing. I told you I had written down that quote in the beginning of my presentation. There it is. I should memorize it. I can hardly imagine a more apt description of my aims for Christian scholarship. And it's an honor that the book was regarded as an embodiment of those aims. And it's really special to be here and see the community that has produced that prize and spend a day with it. I think that's great. And I want to emphasize that I see the Aldersgate Prize. This was another promise I made right before dinner. I see the Aldersgate Prize, and I saw it this way even before my book won it, as a celebration of or recognition of how we can live into the Ninth Commandment. So what's the Ninth Commandment? Is that, who gave it? Okay, up there. Do not bear false witness, yes. Do not bear false witness. Oh, I heard it. Against your neighbor. Against your neighbor, thank you. Yeah, you must not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Yeah, we'll start with that. That commandment is not only about lying about your neighbor in the midst of judicial proceedings. And it's also not only about lying. Let's think for a minute, just a minute, before we get into all this, let's think for a minute about how to think about the commandments. So John Calvin, yes, I had to mention him, <laughs> had what he called a synecdical approach to the Ten Commandments. His synecdical approach, does anybody know what synecdoche means here? It's where a part stands in for the whole. Smaller part stands in for broader meaning in this case. So his synecdical approach emphasized that you have the word or the commandment, do not bear false witness against your neighbor. And then you had all related prohibitions or requirements outside that. This was implied. Right? Don't bear false witness against your neighbor, but implied in this is also don't bear false witness. That's where we started, right? That's why we think of it this way. We think of it as, well, of course, it's more expansive than don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Why would you bear false witness against anybody or about anything? But then Calvin expands it still to all the opposite. That's interesting. What does it mean if you're doing the opposite of bearing false witness? You're telling the truth. Right? You're telling the truth, or as I'll tell you in a minute, you're, submitting, you're discovering the truth and submitting to the truth in docility. And then he expands it still further to all actions or attitudes that are related, that support that. So we have to have an action or attitude, or actions and attitudes, that help us live into this high regard for truth, this discovery of, submission to, and docility before the truth of God's creation. Some may think that's wild. Some of you may be out there thinking, I knew Calvin was crazy. Like you, you may be out there thinking, like, that's way above what scripture says. That's way different. But is it really? Isn't this exactly what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount? You've heard it was said, do not murder. But I say to you, whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Very good. 
whoever calls his brother a fool is a murderer. That sounds an awful lot, an awful lot more expansive. Jesus wasn't saying, hey, by the way, that Old Testament stuff and the Ninth Commandment, it wasn't important. Jesus was saying, hey, by the way, this is what it always meant. And so when we think about the Ninth Commandment in the way that, say, John Calvin might help us think about the Ninth Commandment, we're getting awfully close to this model of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. I just share that only because there are a lot of people who might say, yeah, I sort of resist that. What it says, it says. And that's it. That's a conversation we need to have with Jesus. If we take this approach to the Ninth Commandment, it suggests that it prohibits lying about your neighbor. It prohibits lying about other things. It enjoins telling the truth and demands all actions and attitudes that demonstrate regard for the truth. The ninth commandment is, docility, is about docility or teachability before the truth that we can learn about God and God's creation and ourselves. So back to the text there with the ninth commandment. Put yourselves in the shoes of the tempted person. Your neighbor is accused of something, and it would be really convenient for you if they were convicted. Let's say you don't like them. Let's say they're on the other side of a lot of arguments in our culture wars. You want to own the other side. Let's say they have something you want, and if they would go away, it would be really convenient. You've been asked to testify. How do you handle the truth? Well, the wrong way to handle it is to twist it so that it fits our outlooks, narratives, preferences, desires, and instincts. The right way to handle it is submit to the truth even if the outcome might not be the thing we want. If we really, really, really want our neighbor going to go jail, and telling the truth won't result in that our job to tell the truth. So the commandment is about not manipulating the truth, but learning it and submitting to it, even when that doesn't seem convenient or easy or efficacious, even when our side doesn't win, even if we dislike the people who will be vindicated when we submit to the truth. It includes learning and submitting to the truth about God and God's world in all that we do. So this is where we intersect again with the values recognized by the prize. Challenging the reductionistic trends in academia sounds an awful lot like, hey, there's a convenient version here. I could go with the easy version. I could go with the version I thought I already learned. I could go with the thing I taught five years ago. I could go with the thing that would win me a prize somewhere else. I could go with the thing the publisher wants me to say. But discovering and disclosing the truth, even when it doesn't fit with what others prefer to hear, or what we used to think, or what we prefer to say, or what we like to be recognized for, or what outcomes we want, that's important. That's the ninth commandment. And to me, that's the Aldersgate Prize. To me, that's why I've been following it. For me, that's why when I opened the email, I had no idea I was nominated. But I was super excited, because I wanted to read the next book that was recognized for that. And I'm really thrilled that there's a community here that prizes that and lives into it. And you did it all day, and I just want to encourage you to do it more. Tomorrow, next semester, when you graduate, keep it up. So for tonight's talk, I want to see this thread that I'm laying out here 
and I want you to see this thread that I'm laying out here, in a series of moments, revelations or recognitions or realizations that led to the book. Dig deeper, I'm gonna dig deeper on a few points and explore maybe what's actually just a footnote in the book and then look to the future and briefly conclude with some implications for all of us. But as we go, try to trace this thread, the same thread you've been celebrating for years. Try to find it. If you can't, the book didn't deserve the award. So I'm just gonna say that. Or maybe I'm a bad presenter and you can read the book and find it in there. <laughs> so first, the first and second realizations that I want to walk you through here. And this is not going to be me unfolding the argument of the book. There are lots of reasons for that, not the least of which is so many of you have already read it, which is great. What I'm going to do is unfold important moments to me in coming to the realizations and insights that are captured in the book. So the first and second realizations. The first realization is the entanglement of nature and culture or environment and society. The entanglement of nature and culture or environment and society. Now, I shouldn't have had to learn this with a big realization. Let's just get that out there right at the beginning. This is something that's obvious to a lot of people. But it's also a nice little dualism that we've created and yields a lot of um, convenient insights for us that are not as truthful even if they're more efficacious. And we live with them often. We live with the idea that nature and culture are different, environment and society are different, they're not entangled. And it's a problematic way to think. But I was thinking this way. And as a graduate student in urban affairs and public policy, working in community economic development, I wondered to myself, why do we have a concentration in energy and environmental policy in this degree program? I don't understand that. How is that urban affairs and public policy? I thought of nature or environment as something that, let's say, Wendell Berry might be writing about, but not something that would be so relevant in the urban landscape of, say, Wilmington, Delaware. Well, I was quickly disabused of that notion. The same communities that I was working in or adjacent to or studying were the communities where brownfields were most prevalent. Brownfields are, by the EPA's definition, sites where real or perceived contamination complicates development or redevelopment efforts. Now, a couple additional points about that. It's almost always real contamination, though perceived contamination can complicate development efforts. People may not want to invest if they perceive contamination, but it's almost always real. And the way that it complicates development efforts is it makes it incredibly expensive to do the work you're going to do. And these brownfield sites were distributed heavily in and toward communities that were largely majority non-white, so black and brown communities. They were distributed heavily in the direction of, disproportionately in the direction of poorer communities. The same communities where community economic development was most needed, were the places where brownfields were most often found. This wasn't a coincidence. It was part of the history, part of the reason these communities needed community economic development, and also it was part of the challenge of doing more. It's hard to stay in school if you're sick. It's hard to stay in work at work if you're sick. It's also hard to build affordable housing on a brownfield if you have to pay for the remediation first. You know what you can build there? If it's riverfront brownfield, you can build really nice luxury housing because you can easily pay for the remediation and pass on all the costs to the people who are gonna pay for their riverfront condos in your nice high rise. 
All the people with the willingness and the ability to pay for that. But, but affordable housing, not so much. So to the extent that community economic development had to do with jobs or education or housing, and it has a lot to do with all three, it was complicated by these brownfields, which were an environmental challenge. Well, I was quickly disabused, therefore, of this nature-culture distinction. It, I, this is so obvious that it's even almost embarrassing to say I had that problem, but it's true. Lots of people have done good work on that challenge. That's actually what I started studying afterward. Second realization. I had a job interview in 2006. And at this job interview, I had to teach in the evening and also present some research there. It was three and a half hours. Deans and presidents and provosts in this room, please don't make any candidates teach for three and a half hours during their job interview. It's wrong. <laughs> but I was coming toward the end of a three and a half hour teaching segment and little presentation at the end on some research. And I was talking about environmental justice. And I mentioned Wilmington's Zero Brownfields Future discussion. It was a, a group of activists, policymakers, scholars, and others who got together and plotted out how could we address all the brownfields in the city. It sounded great. I'd been part of the discussions. Had a nice slide about it. It was the last one. The dean walked up and asked everybody if they had questions. There were a few. And we thought we were done. And the dean said, well, if there are no last questions, and one person way in the back shot his hand up and said, I have a question. This was an economist on the search committee. And he said, why would you want to clean all of them up? And I looked at him quizzically. I was obviously puzzled, I think. <laughs> Probably impolitely puzzled, actually. And I said, what do you mean by that question? Tell me more. Help me understand. That's my, new, that's my new language. Help me understand. Help me understand your question. And he said, why would you want to clean them all up? Some of them will be hard to clean up, complicated, either because of what the soil's like or what the contaminant was or how deep it is or what you have to do to, to fix it. And some of those will be expensive and some will be easy and those will be cheap. So why wouldn't you do the cheap ones and save the money that you would invest on the hard ones and put it in other things? And immediately my mind was turning, ah, I'm going to get you, I got a good answer for this. And he said other things like education and public health and nutrition. And I didn't have such a good answer, or at least not such a good feeling about my answer. The answer I gave immediately was, well, if I'm a policymaker, I don't want to walk into one neighborhood and say, good news, we've cleaned up all your brownfields. Your kids don't have to play near them anymore. And walk into another community and say, sorry, not doing anything about your brownfields. Your kids still have to play near the brownfields. My answer was an appeal to equity. I was saying, here's my reason to clean them all up. It's more equitable. I don't want to walk into those communities and do it. Or it was, a, it was a evidence of the self-interest that policymakers have and they want to get elected again. However you want to look at that, it was a reason. It worked. But it wasn't a great answer. It wasn't a great answer. To this day, I'm still disappointed that I gave that answer. Because I sensed then the depth of the challenge and I passed on it. Does that make sense? I passed on it. What I did was to try to look good or prove myself or give an answer the students would resonate with or get out of the situation or whatever you want to think that I was doing, probably all of the above. And I passed on the hard question and I gave an easy answer. And that haunted me for years. 
I'm not sure I was haunted enough about passing on it. A little bit. Probably I'm haunted by that more now. But I was haunted by the question because I knew there was depth. The question was saying, even in addressing all the brown fields, you're leaving something else undone. There's something else you're foregoing or giving up or undermining or even destroying by not investing in it. You're letting it erode while you're putting that money into all the hardest brownfields, while you're choosing equity. What I understood from the question was that this challenge was more than just which brownfields, it's which principle. And even when you're dealing with which principle, you've got this trade-off thing going on. Are you going to take equity and forego efficiency? Listen, I wanted to do that. I wanted that to be easy. I wanted it to be that I could take equity and say, see, it's the best. It's obvious. This is the self-justifying choice among the two. And this one, not so much. Crass. This is awful. Why would anybody think this way? I mean, deep down, I sort of wanted that. But in the end, can I get away with it in that situation? No. Because the question was harder. The question wasn't, well, you could buy a lot of yachts for that. The question was, that's a lot of textbooks. That's a lot of uh, food. That's a lot of free lunches for children that qualify for that at school. That's a lot of public health service to people. That's a lot of free mammograms. This is really a serious challenge. I can't say, well, obviously equity, but also my economist friend can't say, well, obviously efficiency. And that's a bit of a temptation too, if we're honest with ourselves. Well, it's obvious it's efficiency. You do the most efficient thing, that's the right policy answer. Okay, you've given up on equity there. You have given up on walking into both those neighborhoods and saying we're addressing all your brownfields. You do have the challenge now of walking in and saying your kids still have to play near the brownfields. Sorry. That's giving up something real. That's why it stuck with me. It became part of my classroom teaching agenda in secret ways. I never shared my embarrassment and that story with people. I found different stories to lean into. So there was a classroom exercise that I often did. And this was about uh, power plants, coal-fired power plants in Chicago. There were two of them at the time. One was called Fisk, one was called Crawford. They'd been standing for a long time. Those were both in poorer black and brown neighborhoods on the west side of the city. I said to our students, where do you think we get our electricity? Where does it come from? And they would guess, and they would usually guess right-ish. Illinois has a lot of nuclear power. They guessed that. I don't know how they knew, but they knew. But I would say, okay, those coal-fired power plants that you think are out there, where do you think they are? We eventually discussed where they are. And I said, what do you think we get from coal-fired power plants on the west side of Chicago? Well, we get cheap electricity. What do we use it for? We use it for lots of things. We use it to refrigerate medicine. That's a good thing. We use it to have class at night and in the morning before the sun comes up. You know how many communities around the world depend on education happening after the sun goes down before it comes up? Because they have to work all day when the sun is up. So education can only happen at those times. Educating people with the lights on is a good thing. So that, that's a thing that we did with it. We also lit perimastodon. If some of you know Wheaton, you know our mastodon. We lit perimastodon 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And we also used it to put things on our jumbotron. That's a whole big range of things. Some of them really great and some of them just okay. Not awful. Jumbotrons you know, can get worse than jumbotrons. But that's not super important. What did people on the west side of Chicago get in these neighborhoods? 
Did they get jobs? Or did they, did they get cheap electricity? Not really, not much compared to us. We consumed a lot, they consumed very little. Did they get jobs? No. The power plants did not employ people from the neighborhood. They got lung cancer. They got other respiratory disorders and they died early. Harvard University study finds hundreds of thousands of premature deaths because of those power plants. And I would ask my students, so what should we do about this? They had all these great ideas, fantastic ideas. I'm sure you would have all these ideas. Well, we can build renewable energy. Yes, we can. And we also need to pay money to do that. So we need to collect that money and we need to invest it in those things and we could put it into other things, but we're gonna build renewable energy. Okay, there's a trade-off. Or they would say, I know we'll pay higher prices for our electricity. Not a bad idea. Any of you who've had some economics in this class will recognize that's a pretty good idea. It's, it's internalizing some of the costs. But you can't do that perfectly. There's no system that will internalize all the costs just right so that things are commensurable without remainder is what we call them. But I'll give you an example so that you know what that means. I asked my students, okay, good. Who in here is gonna take the envelope of cash to the mother whose child has died of an asthma attack the night before and say, it's all right. Don't worry. We've been saving up, paying more. Here you go. Oh, that's clearly not the right way to go. I mean, it's not, it's not as if it's not a meaningful thing to do, but it doesn't resolve our problem. There's still a massive cost here that we can't account for in neat ways. There's no self-justifying response here. Even shutting down the plants had ill effects. Shutting down the plants put people out of work, some of them permanently, during the Great Recession. And we know what role work plays in giving people meaning in their lives. Sometimes it plays too much of a role, but it plays a role. We know what it plays in terms of helping people have livelihoods for their families. Most of us experience this, that is we feel it, as if we cannot do anything right. If we're honest with ourselves, that's how we think about this. That's how we feel about it. If most of us in the room are honest with ourselves right now, I'd say most of us are probably experiencing what I just said that way. We can't do anything right. Not all of us, but probably a lot of us. Our typical responses are anxiety, denial, paralysis, skepticism, and nihilism. We get anxious about finding the one right way. We get anxious about finding the self-justifying way. And our denial involves choosing a way and pretending the other things don't cost anything. They aren't real. Our denial involves me saying, of course I don't want to walk into one neighborhood and say, your kids don't have to play near the power, the, the power plant or the brownfields, good news and say to your kids, um, your kids don't have to either because I cleaned it up, and then pretend there's no cost to doing it that way. Pretend my economist friend's question didn't exist or it was stupid. That's what denial looks like. Or denial looks like collecting the envelope of cash and pretending it meant something when the mother's child died of an asthma attack. That's what denial looks like and it's idolatrous. What denial is, is pretending we have a way to justify ourselves, which sounds like substituting for somebody important in our lives. Denial is an idolatrous path forward. And I can't get through a talk, as Dr. Gadero knows, without citing Jacques Ellul, uh, since Dr. Gadero was a super TA 
for a class that I co-taught and a, for a book that I co-authored. I can't get through without citing Jacques Ellul. As Ellul points out, all the gods demand human sacrifice. We create a little god like this is the one way. I'm going to pretend there are no other costs. This is the self-justifying thing. And the things we will make other people do in order to fit that are ugly. And it's wrong. But that's one of our options. We do it frequently. It's probably our most frequently, it's our, it's our strategy of most frequent resort among these four, to pretend the costs don't actually exist. Second, paralysis. To just do nothing until we actually are convinced we found the one way that's self-justifying or the one best way. That's paralysis. You can go at that for a very long time. You can go at that for life. It's not really, not, not really no action because the status quo is a form of action, but we also pretend we don't see that. Skepticism is saying, I, I, okay, I can't know then. I just can't know. If there's no self-justifying path forward, if there's no way I can move forward without any costs, I just can't even know what's right. And nihilism is then it's all meaningless. Forget it. And all of those are very real temptations. So I was wrestling with this for a long time. Those were the things on my mind for a very long time. And I ended up doing one free course at a time, a really fun uh, master's degree in theology at Wheaton College at the encouragement of my wife who said, I think you're getting bored um, and you really liked the faculty development seminars in the first and second year and you should do something like take a theology class which turned into a theology degree. Um, I don't recommend it to everyone to try to do a full-time job and a degree at the same time, but um, I loved it. And I had this class on Dietrich Bonhoeffer and in this class, we read a lot of Bonhoeffer, but one of the books we read was Ethics. Now, Ethics is organized in a lot of different ways because Bonhoeffer never compiled it before he died. He never put it together the way we would think we knew he wanted to. So there are different versions of it, but we read the Dietrich Bonhoeffer Works in English one, and I'm going to come back to that later in terms of how it begins. But there's one page in the middle, there's one section in the middle of an essay where he quotes the Greek poet Aeschylus from the Oresteia, which is a trilogy, from the middle story in the trilogy, the libation bearers, from the part of that where the main character Orestes, thus the Oresteia, Orestes is dealing with a really significant problem. His mom has killed his dad. And he is faced with an awful choice. He can kill his mom to avenge his dad, which would be matricide. Or he can leave his dad's death unavenged. Both of those seem wrong to him. Both those paths seem wrong. Both of those things seem to be the path of justice in one way, but yet not in another. To make things worse, it's only going to get worse for him if he does either one. If he kills his mom, the Furies will come after him. Pictured here. If he doesn't, Zeus will hold him accountable. That's bad news. And so he cries out, right collides with right. He's in the middle of his paralysis over this, and he cries out, right collides with right. So in the middle of this essay by Bonhoeffer, he just says, Right collides with right. Bonhoeffer has this way, he's just quoting things all over the place, like Don Quixote. Just right there, as if his whole audience knows Aeschylus and Cervantes, and that's why you're in the John Wesley Honors College, so that you will know those things and be able to read this. So he drops in, right collides with right, and he says, this is the definitive context for responsible action. He doesn't even tell you it's Aeschylus. If you're not reading a version with good footnotes and you're not paying attention to him, you don't know where he's getting it. But I thought, this is really interesting. Bonhoeffer might be able to help me, or others might be able to help me deal with this issue that I've been grappling with for years. What would it look like 
to approach this question by drawing on scripture and others who stand in the tr Christian tradition. And it's selective. There are other ways to do it. There are other authors I could have considered. But I asked, does the Christian tradition give us language for this? Does it give us something other than or different from anxiety, denial, paralysis, skepticism, and nihilism? That would be good. So some insights. Yes, I do think there are people who help us, Christian theologians who help us think about this challenge. Bonhoeffer is one of them. His work on responsibility, his references to the tragic, when you dig deeper, help you understand this, but there are others. I'm going to call this the tragic, drawing chiefly, but not only, on Paul Ricoeur and Ed Farley. And how I'm going to describe it borrows a little bit from both of them, but I'm going to describe it as the need to give up, undermine, destroy, or forego one or more goods in order to possess or secure one or more other goods. Give up undermine, destroy, or forego one or more goods in order to possess or secure one or more other goods. That should sound pretty familiar. All the examples that we've given so far put you in that situation. This is characterized by costs that we bear. There's a sense of ineluctable guilt, is, is how Ricoeur puts it. A sense of ineluctable guilt. Now, a lot of that is anxiety that's felt in a sort of existential way about the situation you're in. But there's also a sort of real guilt that has to do with how we handle the situation that we can talk about in a second. We can respond to the tragic in ways that Farley calls either subjugating or liberating, which is to say we can push its costs onto others so that we can benefit, or we can absorb costs so others can benefit. Those are our two basic options. There are lots of ways to do each of those, but those are our two basic options, subjugating and liberating. And I argue that you can see this tragic element in modern environmental thought and, and global environmental governance. I'd actually argue that it's the chief preoccupation of modern environmental thought and global environmental governance, but that takes too long to prove, and so I'm not going to try to do that tonight. You can see it symbolized in scarcity, tragedy, and risk. Scarcity is the, the fact that we don't have enough means for all our ends. That's relative scarcity. All of you economists out there understand that part. Then there's absolute scarcity, like we're going to run out of that thing. And whatever we think about things we might run out of, we all have to admit there are things we can run out of and have run out of before. Absolute scarcity. What that means is we can't do all the things we want to do. Right will collide with right. We won't have all the means to pursue all our ends. That's one expression of the tragic. Another is the tragedy of the commons. Some of you probably know Garrett Hardin's 1968 article on the tragedy of the commons. The argument is if you let everybody use a common resource and each of them can benefit fully from using it, and everybody bears the cost, but individuals get the benefits, they will overuse it and ruin the commons. And he uses it with regard to grazing. That's, that's his case. Now, it gets more complicated than that, but that's the basic argument. What's so interesting to me is not that shallow version of the tragic that he's talking about. He says it will inexorably destroy the commons. That's actually a pretty shallow version of the tragic. It hurts to say that. The inexorable destruction of some resource sounds pretty bad. But the deeper version of the tragic here is he says, there's only one way to deal with this, and that is to restrain people, to constrain their freedom, to make it so they can't all use it. Now, however we do that, whether it's lobstermen in Maine making sure somebody doesn't take too many lobsters or too many young ones by teaching them a lesson, which is actually one of the ways this happens, or whether it's by legally keeping people from using your property and fencing it. However we do it, we're constraining people's freedom to just use stuff. So that the deeper tragic element here is you want 
an intact environment or you want a little more freedom to roam and move and do your thing. You can't have both. There's a deeper version of the tragic that's built in there. And then finally, risk. Risk is really a measure of how likely is it that some bad thing will happen if we do all these things. We're really preoccupied with risk in modern environmental thought and global environmental governance. It's a measure of the tragic. It's a measure of when will we pay the price for doing this thing? How many giant oil tankers will cross the Atlantic safely taking oil back and forth before one of them runs aground and we have a problem? Our risk analysts can tell us this. They can tell us how many are likely to get across safely before one of them has a problem. How likely is that pipeline to work until somehow it's ripped open? People can tell us that. It's a measure of risk. It's a measure of the tragic. And so in environmental politics, we're preoccupied with things because we're trying to measure how we're pushing off costs, typically, onto vulnerable communities, voiceless ecosystems, and future generations. That's why we're preoccupied with it. So I also want to talk about some of the biblical connections here. I've talked about the theological language I gained for some, from some people and how I applied that in environmental politics and modern environmental thought. I want to argue that the tragic, as I'm describing it, is actually a feature of God's good creation. There are actually professional theologians in the room. So this is, this is where I'm a little bit out of my depth, but we had a fun conversation about this during the colloquium today. The tragic, as I'm defining it, is a corollary of finitude. It goes along with God created us and the rest of the world finite, as discrete beings, embodied. So if we think about the first human beings, the first human beings, if we think about before the fall and the curse, they were not able to be in two places, three places, four places at once. I'm, I'm going to lean into that. I think that's right. I can't be either. Today I'm here. I can't be in Grand Rapids. I missed a lot of meetings and fell way behind on email. And I also can't be in Wheaton, where my oldest son is finishing his senior year of high school. I would have loved to have been there. That's where I'm going tomorrow. All those things would be good, but I can't do them all. That, I don't think, is different from the experience before the fall and the curse. I think the experience before the fall and the curse is you can be in one place, you can't do the other thing in another place at the same time. You have to give up or forego some other good to do the good thing you're doing now. It's the bottom line. It's not a result of the fall and the curse that we have these kinds of realities. They're built in. And God says they're good. Very good. Now what that means, when God says they're good and very good, there are lots of good questions to ask about that. But I think taking scripture at its word there means at the very least we wouldn't say that then it was bad. That would actually be a, a ninth commandment problem like we were talking about earlier, I think. So it was good and it was that way. And I actually think that it persists that way into the new creation. This is a little bit of a harder argument probably to make, but I think it's really interesting. Uh, Jesus rises bodily. We have no reason to believe that this body is everywhere all at once. Um, people saw it somewhere, sometime, and it did weird things that our bodies can't do and they didn't expect. But rises bodily, and we affirm that bodily resurrection and our own bodily resurrections as finite embodied beings in the new creation. This actually relates to how John Calvin saw the Eucharist. John Calvin rejected transubstantiation, that the elements become the body and the blood of Jesus Christ, and Luther's consubstantiation, that the body and the blood are really present in, with, and under the elements, on account of his affirmation that Jesus rose bodily in 
a finite embodied form and is actually seated at the right hand of the Father and can't be everywhere at once right now. That's not how it works to, for Jesus to be human and risen. If we go there with Calvin, and you don't have to, but I like it. If we go there with Calvin, then we get more affirmation of this condition that we live with isn't just part of the fall and the curse and something we have to deal with now, but God's going to fix it later so we can be everywhere. There's no reason to believe that in the new creation we're sort of omnipresent. And if that's true, then we even then have to think about how are we foregoing or giving up one good thing in order to do one or more other good things. So I want to move on to the, I'll come back to all that at the end, but I want to move on to the Anthropocene and point us to the future. Who knows what the Anthropocene is? Go ahead, Jeff. It's how we understand the world and the impact humanity has placed on that. Good, how we understand the world and the impact humanity has placed on it. It's a new geological epoch decided by professional geological associations uh, that begins when we believe that the fingerprint of human beings is, is indelible on the Earth's crust and that we have actually shaped the Earth more than any other current force shaping the Earth. That human activity has shaped it more than anything else. Lots of big arguments about when the Anthropocene began. I'll tell you what they could have chosen. They could have chosen like transatlantic trade, they could have chosen circumnavigation, they could have chosen when certain species moved from one continent to another, they could have chosen the advent of plastics. There were all sorts of things they debated. And they landed on 1945 in the New Mexico desert, testing of nuclear weapons. And the ability after that to begin to see the signature or fingerprint of human activity in the world in really odd and, um, un, and in ways that were not known before at all, right? really odd ways that were not known before at all, all over the world, because we didn't just stop testing them after 1945 or in New Mexico. So we now are shaping the future of the Earth in ways that we recognize and need to own and think about. My argument is that the Anthropocene is a necessarily, structurally tragic epic. It's a tragic epic because we're now in a situation where we can shape the future of the planet. What this means is there are an almost infinite variety of ways we can shape it. Almost infinite variety of ways. All the little variations would be lots of them, but there are at least hundreds or thousands of the big variations of ways that we can shape it. We can choose bad ways to do that, ways where we're absorbing the benefits and pushing the costs onto others. We can choose good ways to do that, ways where we're absorbing the costs and so that others can benefit. But even when we choose a good way, or if we choose a good way, then what will happen is we will forego all the other possibilities. We will give up all those other possibilities, all those other ways that we could shape it and live that might have been good, because there's more than one. I think understanding the tragic, understanding that aspect of things and how we don't need to be in denial or paralysis or skepticism or nihilism will help us. It will be one of the tools we need to live in the Anthropocene. I'll skip a little bit because I know, I think I'm coming up on time. Okay. So what, I, what I'll argue is we can have, we can't have the good Anthropocene in the way of a self-justifying obvious choice. But there are good ways to approach the tragic that can inform our thoughts about the Anthropocene. And they look like, more like the responsible Anthropocene or they look like the humane Anthropocene. If we take uh, humane there from the Jewish philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, 
who in his commentary on the cities of refuge writes about them as humane urbanism. Cities that are built for the benefit of others from other places at other times, like future generations of other cities' inhabitants who they don't even know yet. What does it look like for us to build a humane Anthropocene? We can't build a pristine one, you can't go back. But what does it look like to build a humane one? So what are a couple upshots of the tragic and how can we respond? This is a conclusion. This slide it was taken um, in Washington, Illinois, after an EF5 tornado hit the town and destroyed most of it. And Wheaton College students went there and helped to clean up and set up that dining room table and chairs so that people could have lunch. There's something evocative about that approach to bearing costs so that others can benefit in the midst of difficult circumstances that I want us to think about. So a couple upshots of the tragic. How do we respond? Where is the hope? Well, when we face the tragic, we can be free from denial, paralysis, nihilism, and skepticism, and free to act despite the fact that we cannot justify ourselves, despite the fact that there is no self-justifying course of action. As Aeschylus said, but still some god, if he desires, may work these strains into a song of joy. That's the response of the chorus to Orestes when he says, right collides with right. That's actually true about our god. We may feel like we're in denial or paralysis or skepticism or nihilism, we may sense the anxiety of not having any way to justify ourselves, and we don't need to justify ourselves before we act. That's not a burden we have to bear. We're free to act even without self-justification. Where's the hope? What does this look like? How, do, how are we transformed by it? What do we look like after we recognize this? What is God doing through it? Well. It's not, I would argue, in God's going to make it soon so that we don't have to actually face these difficult choices. I've already said, I don't think that's going away, literally ever. So the transformation that's happening is an aesthetic transformation. It's a transformation of our judgment. Partly, not only. It's a transformation of our judgment. We actually judge the situation we're in to be evidence of God's goodness and the goodness of his creation. He's given me three options today. I could be here. I could be in Grand Rapids getting work done and with my wife and two of our kids. Or I could be in Wheaton with our oldest child. How amazing is that? That we actually have more good things than we can choose or do that that's how God works, that that's what God's creation is like. How amazing. It's evidence of God's superfluity or superabundance, the, the superfluity of his creation. It's like when the psalmist says, his cup runneth over. I don't know about you, but when my cup runneth over, I don't actually like lick it up like it's a melting ice cream cone or <laughs> try to get all that. I just say, gosh, I couldn't even get it all. There's so much goodness there. That's what my cup runneth over means. It's like that when we have so many good things and can't choose them all. But another thing that's going on isn't just a transformation of our judgment to regard this as part of God's good creation and evidence of his goodness and, and abundance. But we're free to seek the good of others at cost to ourselves. We're free to seek the good of others at a cost to ourselves. So it's not just we're free to act, do whatever. It's we're free to act more and more like the one who made us free to act. Jesus made us free to act, the Sunday school version of this. Jesus made us free to act. 
with his life, death, and resurrection that justified us when we can't justify ourselves. And we're free to act more and more like that in the face of the tragic. That's what shows us the way forward and opens up the possibility of bearing costs so that others can benefit. And the final thing I'll say is that there's a sort of built-in, really great moral pluralism in this system. What it means is that there's a bunch of bad ways to deal with the tragic, all the ways where I accumulate goods for myself and assert myself while I push costs onto you. Those are bad ways. But there's a plurality of potentially legitimate, even if not self-justifying, good ways. How amazing. This is that superfluity again. I'm not waiting for the only one that's the right way. I'm not waiting for the self-justifying one to, to flash in my mind. That's the way. A lot of good ways are before us. And this can help us to be creative and it also disciples us in choosing these paths for the sake of others, for the, to be more for God, to be more for creation, to be more for our neighbors, which is to also say to be more fully human. So I think understanding this helps us with discipleship and transformation in Christ-likeness as well. So that's, that's enough for tonight. I think I've gone a little bit over time, and we have only how many minutes for Q&A? Well, first, let's give them a hand, shall we?